Hello, my name is Hayes Barrett. I'm the lead developer at the Earth Data Analysis Center at the University of New Mexico. And I'm really looking forward to showing you all today what the georeferencing API can do. But before I do, I'd like to talk a little bit about the grant and project that led to this development. The API is part of a larger three-year grant from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission of the National Archives and Records Administration. The purpose of this grant is to scan, georeference, create metadata, index, archive, and make web accessible a portion of the 1934 to 1987 historical aerial photo collection which covers areas across the state of New Mexico. The project is managed by Dr. Sue John. The scanning and georeferencing team is led by Sandeep Talasala and Lisa Sinclair. And our development team is made up of Tyler Eshelman and myself. It should be noted that both the scanning and georeferencing is contributed to by several students and volunteers, all of which we are very thankful for. What is an API? An API, or an Application Programming Interface, is basically an intermediary that allows an application or a script to access remote resources via the internet on a server or on a network. Before I talk about how the API works, I'd first like to talk about the problems that the API is meant to solve. The API was built for this project to solve two specific problems. First, how can we reduce the complexity of managing the scanning, georeferencing, metadata creation, and catalog ingest for so many files across so many projects? This would be much easier if we had a simple API that we could wrap the application around. The application could manage the metadata creation, the georeferencing, the QAQC, the data ingest for online publication, and it could all be managed under one simple web application. The second problem is how can we georeference such substantial amounts of data with limited personnel? This would be possible if we allowed public access to georeferencing capabilities. This approach would allow teachers, students, or anyone interested in georeferencing to contribute to the project. And any issues with public georeferencing quality can be addressed in the QAQC workflow. There are also several secondary benefits to having this software decentralized. One that we discovered during the COVID-19 pandemic. Users could continue georeferencing and processing data from anywhere in the world without any need of special software. As long as they had internet access and they had a web browser, a user could log in while working from home and continue georeferencing as normal. Another use of the API is in environments such as machine learning services where applications and dependencies can be very restricted. If a project that required georeferencing existed in such an environment, the API could be used to do georeferencing using simple web requests. Okay, so now that we've talked about some of the use cases of the API, I'd like to explain exactly how the API works. Now, there are multiple ways of using the API. The first is an interactive approach, using a stream of communication back and forth between the end user and the API, with the result being a geo-enabled image ready for download. The second is a single one-step process, where the user sends a list of GCPs and a non-geo-enabled image and a warp geo-enabled image is returned. First, let's talk about the interactive methods of the API. Interactive mode begins with a simple file upload. This is a standard HTTP form upload using the post method. The file needs to be a raster of type PNG, JPEG, TIFF, BMP, or GIF. Once uploaded, the API will generate a unique identifier, store the file, and configure a web map service. What's returned is a JSON document containing both the web map service URL and the unique identifier that is used in later steps. So let's take a quick look at the format of this JSON response. We have a status key that will either contain success or fail. In the case where the status is anything other than success, there will be a message describing the error. There's the height and the width of the raw image that was uploaded. 
there is a unique identifier that is used in later steps and a web map service URL with a layer name. The web map service is in a raw custom coordinate system. In other words, the raster location of X1, Y1 is represented in the web map service as coordinates X1 and Y1. This makes it very easy for any front end to collect pixel location based on coordinates clicked by an end user. So a web-based front end could easily add a base map and begin collecting GCPs from both the raw image and the base map. Once we have ground control points that match pixel coordinates to map coordinates, we can use the other features of the API, the root mean square error and the georeferencer. Let's start with the RMSE. This route expects an HTTP POST method with the body of the request being a JSON document. Let's take a quick look at the format that the API expects. This JSON document can have any top level key names that you like. This gives flexibility to front end developers so they can track the GCPs in a way that works for them. Here they are shown as 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, but the values of those keys must be a JSON object with four keys, row, call, lat, and long, with row and call representing the pixel coordinates of the row and column of the raw image, and lat and long representing the latitude and longitude in decimal degrees. This JSON can be uploaded to slash API slash RMSE slash UUID. The UUID is the unique identifier that was returned during the upload process. The response is a JSON document that shows the error for each ground control point. Let's take a quick look at this response. We have a status key, in this case indicating success. We have the full root mean square error that is generated server side. And under the RMSE vowels key, the label for each GCP is returned exactly as it was submitted to the API. And the observed as well as the predicted geo coordinates are presented in NAT83 so the error can be calculated in units of meters. The georeference route behaves very similarly and accepts the exact same input and is located at slash API slash georeference slash UUID. And again, this UUID, shown in brackets, represents the unique identifier that was returned during the upload process. Just like the RMSE route, the JSON is uploaded via a POST method. Once the API receives the GCPs, it takes the raw image, translates it using the GCPs, creates a warped image, and adds the newly created warped image as a layer to the existing web map service. The response from the API is a JSON document that contains the new layer name. This new layer can be added to a user interface to give better feedback to the end user about the quality of the placement of their ground control points. This interaction between the user and the API can continue with the user adding, deleting, or modifying points as the API continues translating and warping the image and presenting that information via WMS until the end user is happy with the result. Then the user can download the result of their labor. The download route is a simple git request to slash API slash download and the unique identifier used in the previous requests. The response is the full resolution image that is now georeferenced and ready to use in any GIS application. And that is the full workflow for the interactive method of georeferencing. So let's talk about the one-step method. The one-step method is extremely simple. Its use case is when the end user 
already has the desired ground control points and simply needs to georeference a raw image. To use the one-step method, a post request is made to slash API slash georeference. The body of this request is form data containing both the non-georeferenced image and the GCP JSON. The response from the API is a fully georeferenced image. So now that we know how the API works, I'd like to show you a couple of examples that demonstrate how the API can be used in the real world. These examples will also give you a better understanding of the API by simply seeing it in action. The examples that I'm going to show you are in the GeoReference API codebase. And this codebase is located at the EDAC GitHub organizational page located at github.com slash edac. And there you can see many of our publicly available projects, including the GeoReference API. I'm going to be showing you the examples in the front end examples directory. As you can see, we have both an interactive and a one-step example. The interactive example is meant to demonstrate the interaction between the end user and the API, with the end user supplying non-geo-enabled image and ground control points, and the API responding with feedback for the end user in the form of errors for each GCP and a web map service. And this interaction with the user modifying, adding, or deleting ground control points and the API responding with updated errors and a web map service will go back and forth until the end user is happy with the result and can download their image. The one step example is used to demonstrate the scripting capability of the API. This is especially useful in situations where ground control points are collected by some other means or dynamically created in restricted environments such as an online machine learning service. Let's take a look at the interactive directory. This might be surprising to you that the interactive directory just contains a single HTML file and a sample JPEG. But the fact that a user anywhere in the world with internet access and this HTML file can georeference images really shows not just the power, but the vast potential of this API. If we go back and we look at the one step script, we'll see that this is made up of an Excel spreadsheet that contains ground control points and file names and a Python script. This Python script reads these GCPs and for each file name, associated file name, it will post the image and the ground control points to the API and save the resulting georeferenced image. So let's take a look at the interactive. Now I've already downloaded and extracted this code to my local system and we're going to start by opening this interactive HTML in Google Chrome. So before we can begin adding ground control points we first have to upload a non-geo enabled image and that is what this form on the left is for. Now I'm going to go ahead and choose the sample.jpg but it could be any image you like. Let's review real quickly what will happen once I click this upload button. This image will be uploaded to the API. The API will catalog it. It will generate a unique identifier used in later steps. And it will create a web map service of the raw image. Once that web map service is returned to the client, we can then replace this panel with that web map. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now and click upload and you'll see that we have a uh, web map service of a non geo enabled image. And this is important because this coordinate system of this WMS service 
matches the pixel coordinates for this raster. So by clicking on a point in this web map service, we are actually choosing a row and column pixel coordinate from the image. Just to the right of it, we have a basic base map. And the opposite is true for this, where here, we, if we click a coordinate, we are actually choosing an Earth coordinate. So by combining the pixel coordinates with the Earth coordinates, we are able to generate a ground control point. On the right hand side, we have multiple controls uh, that will show the errors of the ground control points, uh, the full RMSE error, we have show GCPs, which is not interesting yet because we don't have any GCPs, and we have a download button that is grayed out because we have nothing to download yet. We also have this zoom to sample button, and this is specific to this image, uh, the sample image that is provided in the examples. So we don't have to root around all of New Mexico to test this out. So let's go ahead and add our first ground control point and see what happens. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just choose this bush here. Now, believe it or not, Nothing's happened, and that's because we've not yet communicated with the API. And there's a reason for that. We have found in cases where, for example, the raw image is oriented uh, south-north, and if we were to generate, and we can, we can, we can georeference with a single point, if we did that, what would happen is the image would be placed exactly upside down and it would be very confusing to the user. So because of that, we are not going to request a web map service for previewing the warping until we have at least three points. You might also notice that the RMSE is saying to pick three more points and that is because if you have three or less points in your GCP list, the RMSE will always be zero. So that is useless information to the end user. So we are not uh, including it. So, but you could, if you wanted to generate your own uh, front end, certainly you could show the end user whatever you would like. So I'm going to choose another point, and again, no communication with the server. And so I'm going to add a third point. Now we are finally going to communicate with the server. The server will receive our ground control points, and we will finally get a web map service returned. So uh, I haven't clicked yet. So r as soon as we click this, the result of our GCPs will warp the image over here. It will warp that image and present it as a web map service over here. So I'm gonna click. And now we have a preview of our GCP results. And as you can see, we're pretty lucky in that this case, the plane was pretty level to the earth and so things kind of match up pretty well. But we want to add another point to demonstrate the RMSC capability. So I see up here we're pretty far off. I can see that path is not lining up. So let's go ahead and add another point to pin that down. And I'm just going to choose this bush here and this bush here. And uh, yeah, let's take a look. That that looks pretty good. That's lighting up. And yeah, I'm happy with that. But the important thing is we can now see that when we added a fourth point, we communicated with the API and said, give me the RMSC for these GCPs. And so what it did is it created a transformation based on the GCPs provided and then one at a time 
transformed using that polynomial to get a ground control point, or uh, sorry, an earth coordinate. And then that earth coordinate is compared with where we initially wanted it to be. The result is the RMSE is delivered in meters. And this is important because if you had a project, let's say you were geo-referencing very large images that covered a large amount of area. Well, you would expect very large RMSE, even if it was very good and all the points were just really super, you would still expect a, a significantly large RMSE because even the smallest change could be hundreds of meters. The exact opposite is true. If you were georeferencing uh, tiny images, you would get very low root mean square error, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's that that's good. Uh, it just means that your meters are very small. So the RMSE has to be unique to the project that you're working within. All right, so I could continue, you know, modifying and adding and deleting individual uh, points until I was happy with the results. Um, I could end up deleting uh, ground control points, but the end result is this is a demo, so I'm just going to accept this as good. So I'm gonna go ahead and click download and I'm gonna download this example and we're gonna open this up in QGIS. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and add a base map just so we can see that it matches up. And we can see that we now have a fully geo-referenced image ready for use in any GIS application using the interactive method. So now let's take a look at the one-step process. We've already covered the basic parts of the one-step script. The, we have an Excel file, a Python file, and some non-geo-enabled JPEGs. But let's actually take a look at the code. And as you can see, this is a URL that we're going to be posting our images and our GCPs to. We're going to create a folder, if it doesn't exist, an output folder. So we read in from the Excel file, and for each row, we're going to grab the file name, and we're going to grab the GCPs. From there, we're going to build a form that we then post to the API, and the API, if it responds with a 200, a 200 meaning good, success, then we're going to save what is returned to the output folder. So before we do that, let's go ahead and grab the GCPs and the image that we used in our interactive mode. And I'm going to go ahead and open up the Excel file and I'm gonna add the GCPs that we just created. Of course, I also have to put in the name of the file, sample.jpg. This is the non-geo-enabled image. And I'm gonna go ahead and save that. And I'm gonna copy that non-geo-enabled sample.jpg into this example folder. So this is not just going to georeference these images, but it's going to georeference using the GCPs that we just gathered, the sample image as well. So I'm going to go ahead and run that command. And so to do that, I have to go to downloads, georeference, static, front, one step. Okay, and I'm going to simply run Python Python one step py and you can see it immediately created an output folder and it has posted this image to the server 
and the server has responded with a fully georeferenced image and we are able then to save that to that directory. So as these images get processed, you can see the capability of the one-step process to immediately georeference an image as long as you have the GCPs that are generated from an outside source. So let's go ahead and go back to QGIS. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and remove the sample JPEG found here. Uh, and I'm gonna bring in all of those newly generated rasters that are found in the one step output directory. So I'm just gonna simply select all of these and we can see that we were able to georeference all of these images using nothing more but the one step process and including the image that we just created GCPs for. So in closing, I would just like to thank once again all of the staff, the students, and the volunteers who have been and will continue working on this project. And of course, I'd like to thank once again the National Archives. Without their contribution, none of this would have been possible. So thank you.